The Vape Passion Show, episode 38. Hey, welcome back to The Vape Passion Show. This is episode 38. I'm recording this on Saturday, October 15th, 2016. So I'm starting the show with another beer. This one is Imperial Pumpkin Ale from Four Noise... Four Noses Brewing Company. They're based out of Broomfield, Colorado. It's a pretty strong beer, 7.7% alcohol, uh, 65 IBU. According to the Pairwise app, they recommend pairing it with desserts like lemon meringue pie, meringue, macaroons, caramel bacon donut, and persimmon rice pudding. Uh, I don't really have any e-juices like that, but I do have this one from Cloud Provisions. This is a lemon coconut macaroon. So um, I've actually... I've reviewed this and it's okay. It's not the best, but it's about the, as close of a flavor as I have to anything recommended by Parawise. So we're going to pair it with this beer and see what it tastes like. So here we go. Imperial Pumpkin Ale. It looks pretty good. Oh yeah, that's a very good beer, but it's definitely strong. Mmm, that is a very good pairing. Yeah, if you're drinking any IPA pumpkins this this uh, season, this holiday season, go for uh, a lemon meringue or lemon coconut mar uh, macaroon like this. That's a that's a really good pairing. Damn, that's perfect. All right, so um, just a little update with me. So Heaven Gifts reached out to me recently and asked if I would be interested in doing some reviews for them. Um, I agreed to that. So they sent me the Vaporesso e Stock Tank Mega. Let's see, where did I put that? Oh, I don't have it with me. I put it, it's downstairs. But anyway, I've been using it. Uh, I got it yesterday in the mail, and I've been using it pretty much as my sole device until just now when I'm using uh, the Chieftain mod and the, the Goon RDA on top uh, just for this pairing, this beer pairing. But yeah, I've been using that e-stock tank, and it's, uh, it's pretty good. I like it a lot, actually. The only thing, though, is that it uses Vaporesso's C-cell coils, which are ceramic. And if you listen to my uh, one of my recent episodes, episode 36 of this show, um, I talked about a study that UL did about ceramic coils showing that they could be dangerous. Um, I've never used ceramic coils before, and after seeing that study, I didn't have any plans to try them. And I didn't realize that that e-stock tank uh, actually used ceramic coils until I actually received it and opened it up. But I decided that since I already have the tank, I'm just going to go ahead and give it a try. And I have been using it, and the flavor that I'm getting out of that tank is really good. Uh, I don't know if it's the tank and the coil design, or if it's because of the, the coils are ceramic. And, you know, everyone says that ceramic coils you get a lot of flavor out of, so I think it's probably the ceramic coils. Um, I think that Vaporesso also sells cotton coils. I'm not entirely sure. I did a little bit of searching, and I couldn't find anything definitive about that. But if they do, I'm going to have to order some of those and, and try it out with this tank and see what I think. But yeah, the flavor out of that tank is really good. So I should have a review for that up soon. The tank itself is $19. So um, if you like, if you don't mind vaping on ceramic coils, I think that's a really good tank. It's it's not really a, a cloud chasing tank. It's more for flavor. The, the coil that comes with it is a 0.4, I think. And they only recommend taking it up to 35 watts, I believe. So, yeah, you, you can't really push a whole lot of watts through it, but it's uh, definitely good for flavor. And while we're on the topic of new products, have you guys noticed that there re aren't really any great pot products coming out lately? It feels like we're, we're finally starting to reach that point where companies are running out of products to release after those deeming regulations hit. Um, I've seen some good reviews of things, of a few things, but I haven't really seen anything that really stands out. Uh, there are a few things on my wish list, uh, which I'll probably probably pick up on Black Friday when everyone has the, those crazy deals, uh, just like I did last year. Black Friday's one of the best days of the year for for vapors. But um, some of the things that I want include things like the iJoy Combo RDTA, the Ferro Dripper tank from Rip Trippers and Digi Flavor, the Goon RDA, and like I mentioned, I do have the Goon RDA, but this is actually a clone, um, and I like it. I like the clone, but it's very obviously poorly machined this this clone is so i would really like to get the the authentic one i also want to get the obs engine rta and uh, as for mods i would really like to get the lost vape theory on squonker so um i'm hoping to find some deals on those for black friday but 
that's really all I can think of. From what I've seen, there's just not a whole lot hitting the market. Nothing really, uh, really great. Um, but I wanted to ask if any of you guys have any recommendations. And if you do, if you would leave me a note, because I'm, I'm especially lacking in the mod department. So if you have any suggestions there, that would be awesome. All right, so let's get right into it. The Right to Vape Tour, they're traveling across the country, uh, across the United States, and they're holding rallies, meetings, and press conferences in each in each city. And the goal is to spread the word about the FDA, about them trying to, what they're trying to do to the vape industry. And so the goal of this Right to Vape Tour is to change the predicate date of 2007 in the deeming regulations, or, or to get people educated on that. Uh, the tour was organized by the American Vaping Association, CASA and Safada, and they came to my town uh, last Thursday, and I was able to catch the last 30 minutes of it before I had to get back to work. I had a meeting for work, so I, I couldn't stick around. But I was able to see Greg Conley and Alex Clark speak, as well as my local Colorado Safada chapter leader, Kat York, and uh, it was really good. From what I saw, they talked about things like how the FDA's dimming regulations can put an end to vaping by 2018 if we don't put a stop to it. Um, they talked about the importance of everyone educating their local vape shops about what's happening and what they can do to help, and how moving forward, regulations will start from the ground up, uh, meaning cities will try to pass strict regulations against vaping, which will then spread through the state and eventually into other states. Um, that's why it's so important to fight against regulators at a local level. They actually posted a video on their Facebook page if you want to watch it. Whoever recorded that video, they they didn't seem to understand vertical video, and then they turned the camera sideways. So it's probably better just to listen to it if you want to check it out, but it's still a good video to see what they talked about. But yeah, it was a fun, fun event from what I saw. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the whole thing from the beginning, but it's, it's really great what these guys are doing. Uh, there's still a, quite a few stops left. I mean, not a whole lot, but there's a few stops left. Uh, the last stop currently on the schedule is on October 22nd at Phantasm Vapors in Milford, Ohio. But they've been adding stops, so check to, check their site to see if they'll be visiting your city soon. The event is free, and some stops are catering the event. Like the one I went to, they had pizza, pop, and beer. So yeah, if, um, if you have the chance to attend one of those, go check out their website and see if they're coming to your city and uh, see if you can go go check that out. All right, the next topic I want to talk about here, um, there's a new consumer advocacy organization that are fighting for the rights of vapors, and this one focuses entirely on nicotine. Uh, this organization is called the International Network of Nicotine Consumer Organizations, uh, INCO for short. They're a global organization that formed after a consumer and organization meeting at the Global Forum on Nicotine. That happened in Warsaw, Poland in June uh, of earlier this year. So INCO, they're currently a, an alliance of 19 nicotine consumer groups from around the world, including groups like CASA, Not Blowing Smoke, and the new Nicotine Alliance. If you look at their about page, you'll see that their aim is to promote the safe use of nicotine and to advocate for reasonable regulations of nicotine products. That includes things like electronic cigarettes, obviously, snooze, and other nicotine-containing products, such as heat-not-burn products like the IQOS, which I think is from uh, Philip Reynolds. They're educating health organizations and regulators on the safety of smoke-free nicotine products. They're also advocating for proportionate and reasonable regulations, for, for duty-free taxes, and for giving business owners the right to allow vaping on their premises, and to prevent bans on products that can save lives. If you've been following me for a while, you'll know that I originally started vaping to quit smoking which worked, but I started vaping again five years later because I wanted the benefits of nicotine on cognitive performance. Um, my preferred method of using nicotine is vaping, of course, but I also like things like nicotine gum, uh, nicotine lozenges, and nicotine toothpicks, like the ones from uh, nicotinepicks.com, which I use occasionally. Um, I also think that nicotine products like snus and chewing tobacco are, are fine alternatives to smoking, and I know that sounds crazy to some of you, but consider what regulators are saying about vaping. They did the same thing to smokeless tobacco. So for an example, uh, if you want to educate yourself on that a little bit, go take a look at the research from Brad Rodu. You can find his website at rodutobaccotruth.blogspot.com. And you'll find that a lot of the stuff he posts about show how the risk claims of those products are actually mostly untrue. Um, I don't use either of those products. I don't use snus or chewing tobacco, but I don't see anything wrong with them. But yeah, so long story short, basically, I'm a big fan of having an advocacy group that focuses on harm reduction with nicotine products as a whole. Okay, now I want to talk about this new thing, this event people are talking about. It's called Hands for a Billion Lives. 
Um, I've been seeing a lot of people talking about it. The idea is to meet up in a predetermined location and hold hands to form a wall and stand in silence. Uh, they say that this signifies the vape community stand against the FDA regulations and to raise awareness for the A Billion Lives documentary. You can find those locations on their website at handsforabillionlives.com and this event will take place on October 22nd and at 2.22 p.m. in your local time zone. Um, from what I've seen on the website, there are only 18 states participating so far, and they're looking for leaders to hold the event in their own cities. Um, there's only one happening where I live in Colorado, and it's in Pueblo, which is like three hours away from me. So I won't be attending, but I hope to see some videos after the event happens. And, you know, if, if I'll keep checking the website uh, throughout the week, and if they do add an event to Denver, uh, I'm going to try to attend. But yeah, check that out if you can. All right, and then the biggest news of the week, uh, the... The big lawsuit with Nickel Pure Labs and uh, the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition versus the FDA, that hearing happened last week. Um, so on October 11th, the judge heard, heard those arguments from both sides, and um, that lasted three hours from what I'm hearing. So Judge Ann Jackson, she asked nearly 100 question, questions, which the, F, the VTA, the Vapor Technology Association, say were fairly ba balanced among both parties, but the VTA believes that the plaintiffs received more time overall. Um, all, a lot of this information comes from the VTA themselves. They sent out an email and uh, the, the subject line was from the trenches, deeming litigation updates and more. And you can also find that same update on their Facebook page, on the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition's Facebook page, and maybe the VTAs I haven't checked. But um, so all this information comes from Tony Abood of the VTA. Some of the questions that were asked were focused on things like the FDA's authority over non-nicotine containing parts and devices, the FDA's authority on non-tobacco e-liquids, the FDA's authority on synthetic nicotine, if the court would be able to review the Administrative Procedure Act of the deeming rule, if the court should consider that FDA had to engage in a cost-benefit analysis, if the FDA could or should have moved the predicate date, and First Amendment issues like if free samples are protected speech, or any kind of First Amendment implications of the Modified Risk Tobacco Products provision of the Tobacco Control Act. And that focuses on things like misleading claims, such as vaping being smoke-free, no ash, free of certain substances, and, and so on. The VTA also reported that a recurring theme during proceedings were about the FDA's misguided characterization of the vaping products market. Uh, a specific example that Tony Abood mentioned was that the FDA claimed that two-thirds of the market is comprised of closed systems made by big tobacco companies, which isn't correct. The FDA also tried to justify the regulations due to the vape industry operating as if, as if it was the Wild West. The FDA claimed that they were not regulating any vape products as long as it would not be used with a tobacco product. Tony Abood of the VTA, he said that the lawyers raised all of the issues that they needed to bring up, so the judge should have everything she needs to know to make a decision on the case. Um, but I've read summaries from other sources who say that the judge she seemed skeptical of the vapor company's arguments and that she seemed misinformed of the in industry. Uh, Dimitris Agrafiotis of the Tennessee Smoke Free Association said that the judge didn't even know the difference between open and closed system products and that she had the typical outsider's view of the vapor industry. Also interestingly, the judge stated that the FDA does not have the authority to change the 2007 predicate date since it's part of the Tobacco Control Act. So that really makes it all the more important to continue supporting the Cole Bishop Amendment to get that predicate date changed. So Judge Jackson, she has several months to rule and can make a judgment at any time, so there's really no telling w when we might hear an update. Some people are saying it's unlikely to happen before the end of the year. Um, so all we can do now is wait and see what happens. All right, so now I want to talk about this uh, this video from Stephen J. Allen. Um, it was posted on YouTube. He's from the Capital Research Center. It, the video was titled "Esigs and Joe Camel." So, Dr. Stephen J. Allen, he's the vice president and chief investigative officer of the Capital Research Center. He talked about the claims of tobacco companies marketing to children and about how these claims appear to be unfounded and and inaccurate. So first, a little bit of a backstory on the Capital Research Center. So they're an American conservative nonprofit organization that was established in 1984. Their website says that they support individual liberties, a free market economy, and limited government. They mostly look at these areas as they pertain to charity and philanthropy. So Dr. Allen, he started the video talking about how politicians 
want people to believe that vape companies are marketing to children. Some of the examples that he gave include e-juice flavors like pina colada, uh, a blue e-cig ad on a bikini bottom in an issue of Sports Illustrated, and an e-cigarette ad that aired during a Super Bowl. The point that he was trying to make there is that these are all places of marketing that are clearly focused on adults, not kids. But these regulators, they, they try to make people believe that they are marketed to kids. He also mentioned a Mark 10 magazine ad that used the phrase, let it glow, which anti-vaping groups are claiming is a play on the phrase, let it go, from that animated movie, movie Frozen. Uh, they're trying to say that it, it must be marketing to kids because it comes from that movie Frozen, which is uh, ridiculous. But he went on to talk about how the famous Joe Camel cartoon mascot from the Camel brand cigarettes, uh, he mentioned that anti-tobacco groups claim that because Joe Camel was a cartoon, it was clearly aimed at attracting kids to smoking. Well, he explains uh, that by that logic, the Michelin Man is selling tires to kids, Aaron Esurance is selling auto insurance to kids, the Sinclair Dinosaur is selling gas to kids, and the Budweiser Frogs are selling beer to kids. He also pointed out that the ads with Joe Camel featured, featured him doing activities like picking up girls in a convertible or playing a saxophone. Clearly things kids like to do, right? And these ads were in magazines like Sports Illustrated and Playboy. Clearly magazines that kids like to read, right? Yeah, so the Joe Camel controversy started after anti-smoking activists funded a study that claimed that Joe Camel was more recognizable to kids than Mickey Mouse. Uh, but the researchers distorted the results of that study by focusing on the stats that fit the agenda of the groups who funded it. And I believe those groups were, were groups like the American Heart Association, the Amer American Cancer Association, and uh, groups like that. So out of the 229 children, Mickey Mouse had a 91.7% recognition, while Joe Camel had 51%. But, you know, that number doesn't work in their favor, so they instead focused on a very small selection of that entire group. They looked at only 23 six-year-olds of the two, 223 total kids. Of those six-year-olds, 91.3% recognized Joe Camel. So the researchers cherry-picked that data, and the media picked it up and ran wild with it. And then that was used to justify government policy on tobacco marketing. Dr. Stephen Allen, he also claimed that this actually protected big tobacco from competition, and it also put a lot of money into the hands of the government and anti-tobacco groups. I don't think that was the intention, but it, it just didn't work the way that consumers, uh, normal people, would have wanted it to work. So now this is all happening all over again to the vaping industry. And Dr. Allen, he also made a really great, great point in his video about how the government and anti-tobacco organizations violated the rights of the Constitution by means of deception. Uh, in the case of Big Tobacco, nobody cared because everyone sees Big Tobacco as the bad guy. And that's not to say they weren't. But the problem is that people who violate rights, they don't stop at the bad guy. Eventually, they go after everyone else, and now that's what's happening to, to the vaping industry. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 38. If you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can also follow me on Twitter at Vape Passion, and I'm also on Facebook and other social networks. You can find links to all of that stuff on my website. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my channel if you aren't already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of the show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or just uh, get notified of when I publish new vlogs, um, subscribe to my weekly newsletter. You can find that on VapePassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at alex at vapepassion.com. All right, I'll see you next week.